Rob, thanks again. I really appreciate you being on the podcast. Uh, if you don't mind, just spend maybe 30 seconds, a minute, uh, give the audience a little background as to who you are and what you do. So I went to law school. I was young. I was 21. Um, kind of felt out of place a little bit. I was an athlete through college. I got, got introduced to the jujitsu jiu club, which we did in the Cornell wrestling room. Um, from there, my first job was in LA. So I was at Beverly Hills jujitsu club and then Eddie Bravo's Eddie, at Eddie Bravo's gym right after they opened. Nice. And, and I met fighters. So my, my background is sports. I grew up in, in baseball. My brother was a baseball player. Uh, I knew how associations worked in sports, and I knew sort of the interplay between antitrust and association. Um, it became obvious to me this was going to happen with the UFC uh, pretty early on. What mm -hmm. in in about two thousand two, one of our teammates at Eddie Bravo's gym got asked to fight Josh Thompson on the undercard of a, I believe it was UFC 44. Oh, wow. So a bunch of people from the gym drove out uh, to watch him fight. What struck me was from the early prelims on at that time, the lower bowl would be packed. The upper bowl would be empty. And it was because the lower bowls were in large part gyms, mm -hmm. you know, gyms and, you know, uh, people from the gyms could afford the lower bowl at that point. So mm -hmm. it would, it would fill up early. Um, what bothered me was after the fight, you know, this is the biggest show on earth, mm -hmm. giant event. There's 15,000 people there. The concession lines are a hundred deep. After the fight, Gerald comes into the crowd asking to borrow money to get home to Oregon. I'm like, what? So I started doing the math in my head and I'm like, this is, this is crazy. These, those guys at that time, were literally paying to fight because mm -hmm. after they did their medicals and they brought out a corner, um, heaven forbid if they were on any supplements or needed spe special right. foods or anything like that, they, they were going out of pocket to fight for the UFC at that point. And, and for years after that, I mean, literally years, the UFC tried to play the game of, oh, you know, we're, we're just scraping by, we're not making money. And I'm like, oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> so I started... That, that's how I started. I started with um, doing association visits and it took, it took me quite a while. I, I would go, uh, I would send out mailings. I would send out you know, little pamphlets and folders and cards, um, basically trying to get into gyms to pitch them on an association. Mm -hmm. I, I got no response whatsoever mm -hmm. for years until Elite XE. And Elite XC was a promotion, um, fairly fairly large. Mm -hmm. They were doing big events. It became obvious that they were out of money and they weren't going to do shows. But what they didn't do was release the fighters. Mm. So some of the agents called me and they said, hey, come, how, how do we get out of this? And I said, well, you can file suit. But if you file suit individually, you're all going to have to... Um, pay the, the filing fee and pay the service fee for each one. And it ended up in California with something like $475 each. Wow. Um, and that's before anything else, yeah. just, just out of pocket expense to get filed. I said, but if we do a suit as an association and they are members of the association, we could do it just once. And I, I proved that up to them from, from that point on. Uh, basically what happened is we drafted a complaint we sent it over to Elite XC, gave them a week, and within the week, they had sold the contracts to Strikeforce and Scott Coker. So they were happy. They were fighting again. They were in a show that was doing uh, production. Um, from that, though, the agents sort of knew who I was. Mm -hmm. Now, when I wanted to you know, come out for a visit or I needed something, I got responses. And that started at around 2008, 2009. I, um, I did a presentation at, at West Virginia Law School, I want to say in 2011, 2010 or 2011, um, basically ex explaining this industry to the law school at West Virginia. And one of the professors at the end in the Q&A said, why hasn't there been an antitrust suit? 
And my response was, because there isn't a plaintiff. Mm. Um, so my background, uh, you know, my, my day job, I, I was doing real estate law. This, this is a funny story you'll like. Mm -hmm. I, probably almost two years before we filed, our, our, one of the writers, John Nash, sort of figures out in a way that he does. He acts like he knows more than he does. And he calls four different people to triangulate. He was doing that to me. And he'd call me up. And he's like, dude, I know you're working on an antitrust suit. And I was like, John, I'm a real estate lawyer. I, I didn't even take antitrust. Yeah. <laughs> this went on for like over a year. And he, um, by the second year, he'd be calling. He's like, come on, why are you jacking around with me? Why are you just making me spin my wheels? I know you're doing it. Well, about a year before, almost a full year before, he calls me up and he says, I know you were in San Jose. I know three of the four people that were sitting at the table with you. So if you don't give me something, I'm going to publish tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, all right, John, I'm working. <laughs> I just, <laughs> you got to chill out. You can't publish. <laughs> Good old John. Uh, so yeah, that, that was kind of what was going on behind the scenes. Uh, some of the media knew um, uncomfortably ahead of time, you know, much further ahead than, than we wanted. We didn't want it leaked. Um, thankfully, it really didn't get leaked. Um, the, the way that I got involved in the antitrust suit is through that West Virginia presentation, which got published by a few of the uh, websites. You know, they got a hold of this PDF. They published it up. Um, Pat, Pat Milicic saw it. Yeah. Um, Carlos Newton from Toronto was asking around, hey, who's figured this out? Who's, who's going to file this antitrust suit? And he, he calls Pat, and Pat says, call Rob. So Carlos calls me. I'm going to get a prop here. Oh, no, I can't. It's at my office. Damn. <laughs> I was going to show you a prop. Um, but anyway, he calls me. He leaves me a message on my voicemail. And at that point, I was getting sort of a little tired. And, and by tired, you know, I sort of take breaks. I was getting asked to do a lot of favors and to, to, to train a lot of people who wanted to jump in and do media or, you know, whatever. So I was kind of, I, I was sort of brushing this message off. So I listened to the message and he, you know, Carlos is like, rah, rah, rah. he sort of mumbled. I'm like, the heck is that? So I was debating, do I even want to call this guy back? So I call him back. We play phone tag for a couple of times. He finally answers. He's talking. I go, hey, how'd you get my number? He goes, Pat. I go, Militich? He goes, yeah. I go, oh, okay. So maybe I should be talking to this guy. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? And he's like, well, if I fly into Phoenix, do you, do you have time to meet up? I'm like, sure. Yeah, I, thought he, I thought he was talking about dinner. Mm -hmm. He flies into Phoenix, stays a mile away. Asked me to pick him up in the morning, drive him into the office. He sat in a conference room on Westlaw until I left that night. <laughs> like the third day, I take him to a Diamondbacks game. I go, dude, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. and he laughs and he says, Macy, I know you figured this out. You're filing the antitrust suit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm a real estate lawyer, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't care. You're doing it. Oh, wow. So that, that's, that's literally how that started. That started, he flew in uh, March of 2012, uh -huh. um, stayed here a week. I think he told me day four. Um, and then it took us almost, almost two years from that date to filing. It took that long. I, I had to brief it up. I did a hundreds i believe it was 117 page brief with 300 wow. exhibits and binders like this and i fedexed them around the country to the major firms that eventually came in um i, I had to fly around doing visits with them to kind of convince them you know one of the first questions i'd, I'd get was is there money in this i'm like uh yeah there's big <laughs> money <laughs> there's yeah, big yeah. money in this the, yeah. the promoter just takes it all yeah. Um, so, so, you know, it started literally starting from, they're not, 
combat sports guys. They don't know MMA or UFC or anything like that. Um, but we got we got the best firms in the country on board. Um, so we we were ecstatic with that. They're in it for the long haul. These guys, you know, one of the, one of the fears that we were dealing with early on was, oh, you guys are going to get outspent. UFC is just going to bury you and yeah lawyers and you know that that was a big fear right um the response to that was no 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 these are the guys that take on apple and google <laughs> and, wow. and you know the the giant companies uh in in the world really and they specialize in just this um and, and when i showed them the backgrounds of these firms and introduced them to the lawyers who also started flying around with me uh it definitely put uh, our our main crew at ease and um those guys have been with us essentially since you know a year before filing or more wow. um it's the so same I'm guys just, and they're working on a contingency basis yes yep that's contingent so, it's uh where i'm sure i don't know the exact amounts because i haven't you know i don't i'm not pretty to those but we're well into seven figures and expenses mm -hmm. um which is travel depot uh, right experts the expert uh, economists are, are very expensive mm -hmm. um so yeah the, these suits uh if they're if you couldn't pursue them as class actions they're really cost prohibitive mm -hmm. these cases would never be brought just because right. of the, the time time it takes the manpower involved uh this case now I'm going from memory, so you know, don't shoot me if I'm slightly mm -hmm. off. But there was something like 1.6 million documents were disclosed wow. in discovery, um, which you know, obviously our team wow. has to review. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, if if you guys have ever pull the class certification order or the expert reports, you can find uh these at ufcclassaction.com. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a link called the experts. I'm there, yeah. Paul, Paul Halsinger's reports, you'll, you'll see a lot of the best evidence that we found in our case. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was from a document review. Yeah, this is the website I'm sharing for the audience. Um, can you see this as well? Yes. And so if you can, this is a great website. Did you put this together? Yes. Okay, yes. beautiful. So this timeline is a great feature. I noticed it's not completely up to date because the, the certification is not on here uh, that was just I recently just, passed. Yes, I just sent that a couple of days ago. So that should be up in the next day or so. It'll be on here and it'll be in the update sections as well. Got it. So if you, for, if you click on the home tab, if any fighters uh -huh. are watching this, um, scroll down a little bit. Uh, that contact button. Uh huh. We ask any fighters that are involved in the class to submit your email and that will put, put you on our update list. And it also, you know, just gets us in touch with you. If you have any questions, uh, we can contact you. One of the attorneys on the team or myself will answer any questions you have. Um, as Parsa just alluded to last Tuesday, we got the class certification order where the judge certified the bout class. And, and what that means is instead of up until that point, it was the name plaintiffs, which was Kung, uh, Nate Quarry, John Fitch, Brandon Vera, Kyle Kingsbury, and Javier Vasquez in the first case, pursuing a case, asking the court to certify them as representatives for all the fighters that competed in about between December 16, 2010 and June 30th, 2017. That order made that official. Now those named plaintiffs are representing that class of 1,214 fighters. That's, can we go through those numbers again? So the dates that any fighter would be included in this class action lawsuit would be the beginning date of when? December 16, 2010. Okay, and December, and we'll get, throw this on the screen post-production. December 16, 2010, going up until? June 30th, 2017. And June 30th, just 2017. To explain those, Go ahead. Just to explain those dates to you, um, December 16, 2010 is four years before the date we filed, which was December 16, 2014. And that's just by statute. Uh, the antitrust statute, you, you can look back four years. 
it ended June 30th, 2017, because that was the end of our data. Got it. So Got what it. we did was in June, uh, June, I believe June 23rd, 2021, we filed a second suit with CB Dalloway and Cajun Johnson. And, and that was, so we didn't have a gap in time mm -hmm. because of that four year look back. So this, if the, and this is just the details of that court case that people can, yes. so you've actually gone in and, and hyperlinked it. Wow. This is phenomenal. Okay. Yes. And it's, you know, in large part, a fairly identical lawsuit is just for the later time period. What's going to happen Monday is the, the judge is going to ask us about uh, our plan for injunctive relief and also um, what's going on with the Johnson case, the, the second lawsuit that we filed. It, it, it has up until this point just been stayed. So we filed the complaint, the judge denied the motion to dismiss and then stayed the case. So nothing has happened. Discovery hasn't opened in that suit. Um, we are going to ask for discovery to now open in Johnson. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens uh, next week. Speaking of discovery um, and, and John Nash, uh, you know, it's because of your litigation, this whole lawsuit that the UFC being a private company and not having to release their financials, but because of the discovery, were forced to release financials and through that and basic uh, financial you know, modeling, John Nash was able to present that the UFC, I think it was in 2022, is only earning 13% of total revenue. And you know, that in and of itself should infuriate fighters knowing uh, that most other sports uh, are, are at least 50-50, if not, you know, the Muhammad Ali Boxing Act um, allows for, you know, upwards 70, 80, 90% going to fighters. Yes. Um, why is it that you think that a, uh, this has taken so long? Um, I'm looking at the start, you know, 2014, here we are almost 10 years later. And then B now that this has been certified as class action, how much longer do you think it'll take, uh, for fighters to see any sort of decision from, from a judge? So part of the delay, and this is just, you know, sort of an unfortunate confluence of events for us, mm -hmm. was obviously the pandemic. The pandemic basically shut down, you know, any activity for probably a year and a half or more. And virtually at the identical point in time, there was a Ninth Circuit case uh, at the appellate level dealing with standards that the judge needs to apply in issuing class certification. So our, our judge knew this case was pending, decided to wait until that appellate decision came out because he was going to use the ruling in that case to sort of shape his certification order in, in our case, um, in, in large part because he didn't want to have to do, redo it and he didn't want to be overturned on appeal in the event that he got the standard wrong, so he just so he waited. Um, that's that's in large part the two main reasons for the the large delay with the class certification. Now, in terms of length of case, these cases are, are just extremely complex. Uh, you have to hire national economists. They have to model um, the marketplace. They have to determine um, the size of the market, uh, the market share of the defendant, um, which takes quite a while, and it's uh, a ton of discovery. Um, these cases are typically, on average, six years. Uh, add in the delay because of the pandemic, and the we just you know ran into a Ninth Circuit appeal, mm -hmm. um, which puts us where we are at nine years. Mm -hmm. The hope is, uh, if this case Zufo will appeal the class cert decision. They should be submitting their notice of appeal by August 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, we will get to file a response to that. And then the, the Ninth Circuit should say whether they're, they're gonna, going to hear that appeal. I, I'm anticipating within 60 to 90 days. Um, if they don't hear the appeal, they'll, they'll say denied. 
and, and mm -hmm. we should be able to proceed with our case right. at that point. If they do take the appeal uh, in the Ninth Circuit, that process seems to be about a year long. There'll be a briefing schedule set, and then at the end of the briefing schedule, usually a hearing. Mm -hmm. There doesn't have to be, but there usually is. Um, that process would be a, about a year. Uh, add to that the two to three months waiting to see if the Ninth Circuit's going to hear the case or not. So figure that would put us into probably early 2025 mm -hmm. before we could proceed with summary judgment mm -hmm. um, or, or to ask for a trial date. Got it. Um, how confident are you in, in your case? We've been confident all along. I mean, to us, the facts were self-evident. Um, I've been sure of this for at least 15 years. Mm -hmm. To me, it, it's obvious. Um, that hasn't changed. I mean, okay. our, ca our case got better after discovery, not worse. Because nice. before, it, it was, uh, you know, me, me doing models based upon slightly incomplete dat data, just because I didn't have, didn't have everything. Sure. Well, after we got the data, not only did we get the data, we, we got internal correspondence where they're admitting we have a pay structure. Oh, we have man. a pay structure. <laughs> Joe Silva flat out says, I'm not messing up my bottle for one fighter. I would have to justify that to the other managers. Wow. And this is very incriminating evidence. Yeah, they say it repeatedly. Or, or another, Joe Silva sends an email. This was just prior to the strike force acquisition. And it was listing fighters ranked one through 15 in each of the major weight categories. He forwards that to, I believe, Lorenzo Dana, Lorenzo and Dana, with the subject line, we own MMA. He's asked about that. What do you mean by that? Well, we had most of the top guys in every weight class. <laughs> wow. What, what's yeah. amusing to us is for years and years and years, we were called liars. We're inventing uh, data. We were lying about side letters. We were lying about pay mm -hmm. percentages. We we're making things up. Well, no, it turns out what we've been saying all along is true. Mm -hmm. Now that we have the data and um, that, that website that Parsa showed earlier, anyone who wants to see some of the best evidence in the case, pull those expert reports. It's all in there. The class certification order will be put up on that site as well. Uh, the judge cites a lot of these same documents, the same internal correspondence, and he sort of describes the conduct that he, at least at the class certification level, saw as anti-competitive. Mm -hmm. What would be the total damages, roughly? I know you'd have to, you know highly guesstimate here but what are we looking at in terms of punitive damages so our our experts uh model damages and it depends on you know exactly what assumptions are used or what model is used but the the damages were between 811 million and 1.6 billion assuming the judge rules in your favor um, how likely is it that the UFC just pays that immediately uh, to the, you know, the trust that would be set up on behalf of the fighters? Like, can, essentially, I'm just asking, like, are, are there ways for them to just drag this out for the next couple decades and not get, get the money to the fighters where it belongs? Uh, if we went through to, to judgment, got, got a verdict, by statute, that amount is tripled. Um, and that's sort of to incentivize private plaintiffs to bring these suits because they're very, very rare. They're, they take a long time. They're extremely expensive. Uh, they're risky. So that, 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 that troubling is there sort of to encourage private attorney generals mm -hmm. to, you know, step in and enforce antitrust mm -hmm. in, in the events, you know, whether it be, through a uh, verdict or settlement, um, no, they wouldn't be able to avoid paying. Mm -hmm. Got it. 
it, with regards to some of the actions that the UFC has already done because of this lawsuit, um, specifically being, you know, shortening their length of their contract, adding a sunset clause. Uh, one of the most famous examples that I've often referred to in my podcast is Francis Ngannou, how he was able to perfectly time the exit. Can you talk to us about, you know, how that all kind of came about, how they restructured contracts? What did you do? What did they see? Well, th this is from NASA's reporting. Um, it, it appears that for a period of time, at least some fighters had a sunset clause inserted into their agreements. One of the arguments in our lawsuit was these promotional agreements essentially are perpetual. They could, they could go on forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you saw guys retire in 2008 and they're still under contract in 2016. Like <clears throat> Nate Diaz was still under the same contract for over six years. Mm -hmm. The idea of the sunset clause is they would now be able to argue our contracts aren't perpetual. They ended. Nash has reported that after the sunset clause was used by Francis Ngannou and I believe Paulo Costa, it was then taken away. It was, it was oh, wow. no longer put in other contracts going forward because two guys used it. What's very unfortunate and sort of blat makes blatantly obvious to me what's going on in this market is Francis Ngannou becomes a free agent. He's going to earn more. I believe in one fight than he has in his entire career, but not in MMA. He's got a box. He's a world champion to MMA fighter. Doesn't that you know sort of yeah. suggest there's something going on Absolutely. with this market that is not correct? Yeah, it does to me. I, I'm just you know I'm not a lawyer. I'm not familiar with court cases. I'm a I'm a fight fan as you are, and I you know I think. What really draws me to your story is that mine is very similar. You know, I train alongside these fighters. You know, um, there's a certain camaraderie you build. You know, getting punched and kicked and strangled by them, and then when you come to find out um, the, the the business side of it, and like you, you know, I took a look around and I'm a finance guy. I immediately was like, "What the hell? This is a lot of money that they're making." And it took me going to a fight, spending my own money back in 2014. You know, and then going to the gym the next day and realizing these guys are driving Ubers and Lyfts and training two times. It just didn't make sense. But anyways, all that to say, I, I'm I'm very hopeful that this transpires, but the UFC is so powerful and they're so dominant. Um, and I'm admittedly a fan of their promotion. I'm a fan of many promotions. I don't agree with their business tactics, but I would just assume that they're so big that they're not even maybe they're thinking that there's a way to get out of this or um, I don't know. Yeah. So what, what are the fears even up until filing? I mean, Nate Quarry was getting asked this the day we filed, are you guys trying to kill the UFC? And Nate, Nate would smile and he'd say, I realize it's all going to be okay. Mm -hmm. UFC is not going away. It's just instead of them keeping 80 and fighters getting 20, that split should reverse a little bit. Mm -hmm. Fighters are literally the product. Yeah. And th this is why sports and combat sports in particular are sort of a very unique industry. Like uh, The example we used in one of our hearings was an iPhone. You have thousands of engineers that work on various components that go into an iPhone that sells for $1,200. If I pick engineer 732, what is his value increment to this product? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to figure out. Not so with an athlete. They are the product. Yep. I've been saying this to fighters that I have on my podcast. And to me, uh, I always urge them to join you know, an association, if yours or, or just an association band together because they're going the you know you could triple your income if you get a 50 50 split and you're getting 13 right now even if we triple your income you're not at 50 50 but just imagine you know some fighters think they're making a lot of money they're very happy 
but they don't realize that they're still getting screwed. You know, they're, they're not really getting the fair end of the deal, but they don't even really realize it. We call it the, the fighter's career arc and, and we, we see it repeatedly. It, it's, it's typically, you know, you, you have fighters fighting in regional local shows for $400, you know, maybe not even that until they get six, eight wins. And then they move up to the regional level where they're making, you know, maybe 2000, 2000, 4000, 4000. Finally, they, they get a call to go to the big show and they're just so ecstatic to be in the big leagues that, you know, the money's going to take care of itself. All, all fighters are going to be world champ. Ask them. All, yeah. They all yeah. are. And then <laughs> six years later, I have asked six them, years yeah. later, they realize, oh, shit, I've got four surgeries, broken orbitals, hip. I need hip replacement, and I didn't get anything for it. That's the typical career fighter arc. We, we see it over and over and over. And um, on top of that, part I think part of the dynamic as to why that occurs is to even do this sport, you have to you have to be a little <laughs> on the extreme side to start with um, because of the extreme risk. I mean, fear, there, there's a lot of yeah. fear involved. Yeah. Um, I think people think fighters aren't, don't don't feel fear no they they do i yeah. mean i've been backstage with them yeah uh, a production runner backstage will 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 walk around uh tim you're up in 10 and that means the fight before him has started it's in round two you're up in 10 yeah they start puking immediately yeah. some of these guys they puke literally until they're coming out of the tunnel the curtain <laughs> op opens up I've seen guys, they're standing, they're puking. Yeah. That curtain op opens up. You think they're totally fine. And then wow. after the fight, it's the exact same thing. They come through the curtain, fine, puking again. Yeah, man. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. And, and then on top of that, they have no money. Most of these guys are broke. And they're not eating regularly because they're cutting weight. Think of the stress they're under. It's crazy. That, that's like... They're worried about money and they're not eating. It's horrible. Yeah. Having been a fighter's advocate now for five, six years and sitting down with some of the biggest fighters in the world and to having these conversations, it, I am almost a little frustrated because I feel there's so much incentive for them to band together if they all just had a good leader, I would say, and they realized that it could be done in a short amount of time. Uh, well, like we just saw what happened with UPS Union, all the benefits that they're receiving or, you know, what the actors are striking for. And I just feel that if there wasn't a light at the end of the tunnel for them, they saw it, they had good leadership and they could be rewarded with tripling their income or at least getting it, you know, treating their fight career with the respect that it deserves, knowing that they, they can survive and feed their family and have something left over when it's all said and done, especially if they're in the top 15 for consecutive years. Right. So um, I would hope that that would happen, but I'm just so frustrated as to why it hasn't. And it's been so long. Here's, here's the trick that was done in MMA and, uh, Virtually all of the current fighters have never competed in a national sport. So they don't even realize sort of the control mechanism as to what's going on mm -hmm. in, in every other sport. If I win, I ascend. Then there's a playoff. If I win, yeah. I ascend in, in this sport and only this sport. If I win, they can say you don't ascend anymore unless right. I sign your deal. Right. That's a reality show where yeah. the producers dictating who's moving up the ladder, yeah. not competition result. And the reason they were able to do that was the, when the Ali Act was passed in 2000, it said boxer. It didn't yeah. say mixed martial artists, combat sports athletes, none of that. It just said boxer. Yeah. So the Fertitas knew. We just, we're, we buy the UFC, we are going to own the sport. Yeah. And the, the, the way that you do that is you control ranking, you control title. Now to move up, you dictate terms. Yeah. 
how did they get their title to be worth what it was? They just bought up and closed ever, the other titles. <laughs> yeah. WC, Strike Force. <laughs> WFA went away, bought yeah, assets from that. Yeah. Uh, Pride. Pride was huge. Bought that, closed. Um, yeah, it's, it's no mystery. Once, once they assemble the vast majority of 1 through 15, and it's somewhere between 94 to 99%, over any uh, period of time, UFC has uh, one through 15. It's in the 90s percentiles of each weight class. And mm-hmm. they have virtually all of the top. Mm-hmm. Now to go to the public and say, you know, I deserve your money. Watch my fight. There's only one place for me to go. I have to go there. Yeah. L- let me ask you this. Let me steal man this argument. In a weird way, I respect the Fertitas in terms of their business acumen, being you know, a business owner and trying to grow multiple companies as well. I look at their an initial tactics of going out, maybe purchasing competitors to increase their EBITDA. Maybe that at the time was a good financial decision. Do you think that there was a time that they realized, man, we are now actually not just being good businessmen, we're, we're breaking the law? Or do you think that that could have just happened organically and they didn't even realize it? Uh, I'm fairly convinced they knew what they were going to do from day one. At the absolute beginning, they knew. Mm -hmm. The only question they didn't know is how long is it going to take? If you remember back, I believe it was 2004 or five. And, and I still joke around with uh, Randy Couture and Sam Spira about this today. UFC sent Chuck Liddell to compete in Pride. And the reason they sent Liddell is Randy beat Chuck. Randy was then champ. Chuck wasn't. Mm. Otherwise, it would have been reversed. They would have sent Randy. Mm. And the reason I think that was fortuitous is I'm fairly convinced Randy would have won that tournament. That would have hastened the demise of Pride. Pride mm-hmm. hung around longer than it than they wanted it to, because when Rampage beat Chuck, that's an eye opener to fans right. across the world. Right. Some of the best fighters are in Pride. Right, right. It just took a little longer. Yeah. Do you see that ch- taking place with PFL or Bellator or one? Or what? What are your thoughts on maybe the merger between PFL and Bellator? I, I'm not sure if that's finalized or even going to happen mm-hmm. yet. Uh, I've heard rumors that that is is happening or is going to happen. I'm not sure. Yeah, me neither. Um, the, the if you were to ask me, as you know, somebody who knows combat sports, it's not worth any amount of money. You're setting money on fire until the structure of the sport is fixed because nobody can compete. Mm. it's not like i just assemble another pool of fighters and say oh these guys are just as good as the recognized champs and the all the top contenders i need access to have my guys compete against that pool which is what happens in boxing Mm -hmm. and the mechanism to make that happen is rank and title have to be independent of the promotion or if the promotion's putting up a belt contracts have to be non-exclusive Mm-hmm. So I can move around horizontally. That's the trick that was pulled. There is no horizontal movement. They assembled all of the top fighters in every weight class and then said, if you guys want to compete for uh, public prestige, you got to come here. Got it. Um, a lot of craziness in terms of, you know, the, you know, Dana White, Jake Paul, um, going back and forth. Do you see Jake Paul's? I know you have the MMA F- FA and he has the PFA, but essentially two organizations. Do you think his, because of his marketing prowess and just who he is, um, that the fighters may want to join an association just because uh, of what he may be offering or the noise he may be making? So, so Jake's superpower seems to be uh, 
an unbelievable ability to generate publicity for absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, we've reached out many times to Jake. Um, the publicity and sort of notoriety he can generate uh, is would be great. He has no idea what he's talking about with the PFA. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just saying stuff to to say things, and it's sort of telling. If 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 I was going to start a, a financial endeavor, wouldn't I talk to people who were in finance? Mm -hmm. It's like there's a group of people who have been doing this for yeah. 15, 20 years, Jake, and you haven't talked to any of them. We've asked. We've invited you. You've got contact information for the guys. Call one of them. Hasn't happened. Seems to me they they just want to do it, try to do it on their own, in their own terms, in their own ways. But, Could you be. know, it is what it is. Um. What what are your thoughts on what just happened with Derek Lewis? He was in free agency, and there's talks of him, you know, potentially fighting a Francis Ngannou guaranteed massive paycheck. Why do you think fighters like him just immediately go back to the UFC? It doesn't even seem like he shopped the market for more than a week. I, I was a little surprised by that. Um... I can't answer you know what the fighters are thinking other than the, the Francis route's risky. It's riskier. Yeah. Um, it's possible the UFC made him guarantees that he didn't have before. It's possible he got a signing bonus to come back. Um, the, the problem, I think Francis is even, even going to come into this problem soon. Is So he's going to have that huge boxing fight. He's not a boxer. That right. That bothers me. He should be able to make that exact same money in a huge MMA bout. What should have happened, what happens in boxing is Francis becomes a free agent. He's still champ. So if Jones wants to be seen as the best, he's got to beat Francis. Not Francis has to fight, has to re-sign with the UFC to fight John. Yeah. It would be the reverse of that. Right. That's how big money fights happen in boxing. And that's how the boxers control the revenue streams. Um. With Derek, it's possible he saw, so I've got a big fight potentially with Francis and PFL, but then what after? What's after? Yeah, but that, that's, I can't imagine he's getting more than four or 500 grand a fight. I mean, he could be making more. I don't know. Probably making more. But I mean, I think that's going to end up happening to Francis. So after he has his boxing match or two, and he fights who's his who's his MMA fight? What big fight does he have? There is none really. There's no opponents. Yeah. Ryan Bader, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know how much interest there would be in that, but no, but he at That's least he's set he's set for life financially. Uh, you know, he he did he did a massive event. He got what was a fair care, fair cut for him for that event. What, you know whether there's another fight for him afterwards you know, is to be seen, but he at least he's set financially, which is phenomenal. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I really hope it happens uh, on many fronts. I hope you know this litigation doesn't keep dragging out, but you know it seems that you just have to be patient with these things. And then I also hope that enough noise gets made on conversations like ours and other podcasts um, about just what the UFC and other promote like what they're deserved of, you know, what they're getting. I sit down with some UFC fighters and I tell them, did you know you guys are getting 13%? They have no idea. These, you know, you, it's, it's shocking to me um, that they're just not aware of it. So, you know, raising the awareness is I think the first step. One of the other things that we've been working on for years and hopefully we get reintroduced soon is I referenced this a little earlier, the uh, Muhammad Ali Act mm -hmm. applied just to boxers. The, the, mm -hmm. the reason that act works and, and people, you know, tend to criticize it by saying, you know, there's hardly any case case law. There's very few lawsuits, it's sort of self-enforcing. And the, the reason for that is it prohibits a promoter from issuing rank and title from management 
um, and from from sanctioning. It, it basically sets up a separation of powers between the three, which provides leverage and power to the boxer. Mm-hmm. Our amendment would change the term boxer to professional combat combat sports athlete. Um, just to expand it so MMA fighters now are, are under the exact same structure that boxers are. The, the other great thing in that act that boxers get that MMA fighters don't for some inexplicable reason is they get disclosure from the promoter as to how much money their events generate. So mm-hmm. they know mm-hmm. their next fight, they know my last fight earned X amount. They use that to negotiate their next bow. Right. And the MMA literally states Utah, hello, <laughs> just came out and literally published a blurb that is the direct opposite of what the GAO made in its findings with the Ali Act. And that disclosure helps boxers negotiate higher purses. Mm-hmm. Utah said, no, 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 no. We want to keep these confidential because that is for the benefit of the fighter. That's ridiculous. Yeah. No other sport does that. It's absurd. It's yeah. literally absurd. In fact, states are now passing transparency and pay, yeah. pay equity statutes. Right. But in yeah. athletic commissions, oh, no, no, no. We need to keep this private for the benefit of the fighter. That's a, that's a joke. Yeah, it really <laughs> that is. That is a joke. Yeah. It may <laughs> Well, yeah, there's a lot of jokes that you can find in this whole situation. Um, I commend you for what you do, Rob. I really do. You know, I, you you remind me a lot of myself, just a, a fighter who loves the sport. You're not, you know, you're doing this out of the goodness of your heart, first and foremost. Um, and I commend you for it. I, I really want this to go through for the fighter's sake. And um, thank you for your time, my friend. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. And if anyone has questions, uh, you can reach me at rmacy at mmafa.tv. Fighters, put your email uh, on the contact form at ufcclassaction.com. Uh, if you want to speak to one of the attorneys, just in the note section, say, I'd like to receive a call or I have questions about the lawsuit. Um, plan on us doing a tour around the country to the major gyms to explain you hear my my dog growling no, in the background good. um yeah so we should be going uh doing basically a tour to the major gyms explaining what the class certification means explaining the lawsuit explaining what it means to the fighters mm-hmm. essentially the fighters now don't have to do anything mm-hmm. uh, some fighters are still getting solicitations and the solicitations will say stuff like in order to share in the recovery of the class action settlement, you need to retain counsel, hire us. Mm-hmm. That's not true. Okay. Um, if you are contacted by anyone other than the five law firms listed on that site, you'll see a, a tab called legal team. You can disregard. You are automatically now a member of the class unless we're it's overturned on appeal, mm-hmm. uh, which we don't anticipate. Mm-hmm. Um, but as of today, you you are already a member of the class. You don't have to do anything. Okay, definitely. And and guys, uh, we'll we'll try to share all this information in the description as well. Leave us all these links. So if you are a fighter watching this, you are interested uh, in doing what Rob just mentioned. We'll try to make it as easy as possible. Again, thanks so much for for your time. Hopefully, we'll meet in person one of these days. But until then, yeah, fight sure. the good fight, my friend. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Cheers. Bye bye.